Hi, my name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Museum Open House. This ongoing series features and highlights many of the outstanding museums and other cultural institutions. The main purpose of most programs is to inform viewers about current and upcoming exhibits, various programs, resources, and other opportunities that are available for the general public. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guest, Victoria Sunnergren from the Shelburne Museum located in Shelburne, Vermont. Victoria serves as the museum's first associate curator of Native American art. During the program, we're finding out about the museum's very exciting and noteworthy Native American initiative and the current outstanding exhibition entitled Built from the Earth, Pueblo Pottery from the Anthony and Teresa Perry Collection, which is on display until October 22nd. Let's start by meeting Victoria and then learning all about the Shelburne Museum's Native American Initiative and the Built from the Earth exhibition. Welcome, Victoria. So delighted to be able to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, it's been very interesting reading about the initiative, the current exhibition. Definitely look forward to hearing much more about it and having you inform viewers. But before we jump right to that, also think it would be of interest if you just briefly maybe share a little bit about your background, professional interest, and what attracted you to the museum. Sure. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Delaware. I should finish next month in September. Um, so almost done with my PhD. I'm also an Andrew W. Mellon fellow there. Um, and so I've been focusing throughout my academic career since undergrad um, on Native American art and specifically on Pueblo pottery. So this exhibit was kind of a great place for me to start with, with the Shelburne Museum. Um, I also have lots of interests in the digital humanities, in material culture studies, um, and so my interests kind of fit right in with Shelburne Museum. Um, I'm very interested in broadening definitions of American art and thinking about who else is American that hasn't been included in American art and history exhibitions this far. Um, and so including Native American art at Shelburne Museum is the perfect place to start with that. Most definitely, most definitely. Would you share, just building on that, a little bit about the history, the mission of the museum? Sure. So Shelburne Museum has 39 buildings on 40 acres, um, largely historic buildings that have been brought there. Some, you know, taken across train tracks, others flown in on helicopter. Um, so we have the Ticonderoga steamship that we're most well known for, as well as the lighthouse, because if you have a ship, you have to have a lighthouse. Uh, we have an apothecary, a general store, a meeting house, um, as well as really amazing collections of French Impressionism and American painting, um, a large duck decoy collection. So all sorts of fun things at Shelburne Museum are often called a collection of collections. Um, and we were founded by Electra Habermeyer Webb, whose family um, were very famous French Impressionist collectors. Um, and she was very interested in collections that were varied and alive. That's the quote she always used. She was very interested in things that were used by people, not just hung on a wall all the time. Um, and so we've actually had Native American collections at Shelburne Museum since we were founded. Electra Habermeyer Webb bought some Northwest Coast baskets from the Lewis Comfort Tiffany estate. Uh, and I think that's a great story because it tells us how much Native American art has always been a part of the American story, that even, you know, famous American people such as Lewis Comfort Tiffany were drawing inspiration mm -hmm. from Native American art. Nice. And over the years since then, our Native American collection has grown. Um, we've had uh, pieces brought back from hunting trips to Alaska. We've had pieces brought in as part of watercolor studios where they were inspirations for American artists. Uh, but we've recently acquired a bigger collection that is going to push us in a new direction. 
Right. Well, building on that, why and how did the Native American Initiative come about and what does it entail? Hey, so we were approached several years ago by Teresa Perry, um, who's a late husband. Uh, Tony Perry was a Vermont businessman. He owned several restaurants in the Vermont area. Um, and when he passed away, he wanted to let his collection of Native American art go to a Vermont museum, to Shelburne Museum. Um, so she approached us about taking the collection and our director, Tom Denenberg, realized that we had this pre-existing collection that had been in storage for several years because we had realized that we didn't have any curatorial staff with the knowledge to sensitively and respectfully display it. Um, so it had been in storage since about 2007. And we decided that if we were going to continue to keep these pieces that we already had, as well as to accept new pieces, we really needed to push to find a way to sensitively and respectfully and culturally appropriately display these pieces and interpret them as part of the American story. Um, so at that time they hired me as associate curator of Native American art. So they would have someone on staff with those skills um, and began talking about building a building to house Native American art at Shelburne Museum. Uh, because it really wouldn't be appropriate to put these collections in one of the historic buildings already on campus. Um, so we are building a purpose-built building for that. Terrific. And uh, what's the timeline look like uh, to get things up and available for the general public? Well, we've already opened an exhibit of Native American art, including pieces from the Perry Collection, um, only a small sampling from the Perry Collection, so there'll be a lot more coming. And then we are hoping that the Perry Center for Native American Art will be open in 2026. Oh, wonderful. Of course, things wonderful. happen, you know, supply chains and all that, but we're aiming for 2026. Great. Well, moving on to the current exhibition that we're looking forward to hearing about, why and how did uh, Built from the Earth come about? Yeah. Um, so Teresa Perry, Terry Perry, uh, worked with the museum to kind of select some pieces that would be a good starting point, a good introduction to the collection, as well as to Native American arts at Shelburne Museum. Um, and some of the pieces in this collection, the Pueblo pottery pieces are absolute masterworks. Um, if you see it in person, these pieces are huge. You know, lots of collectors of Pueblo pottery will know that most historic pieces are a bit smaller. Um, and these are very large pieces, very beautifully and intricately designed and uh, executed. And so she worked with the museum to kind of select pieces that would be a good entry point, a kind of first tease of what the Perry Collection will be. Great. And what's some of the goals and hopes of the exhibition? Great. So I wanted with this exhibition to both introduce Vermont audiences to a very different artistic style. Um, and you'll see as we continue to talk that I kind of walk audiences through how the pottery is made because it's a very different technique than on the East Coast. Um, but and then also to highlight the ways in which historic works can be interpreted in new ways and can be interpreted in collaboration with community members. Um, so for this exhibition, we worked with a committee of five Puebloan artists and scholars and culture bearers um, who got to meet with all the different departments of the museum as we created this exhibition to kind of green light all of our um, exhibition design choices and to help us think through ways to exhibit this differently than other museums have exhibited historic native works in the past. You know, for those who haven't had the chance to visit yet, would you please share how the exhibitions laid out and some of the curatorial considerations that you made? Absolutely. I'm really proud of how the exhibition's laid out. It's kind of one of the very important things. And you can see in this image, the big spiral. Uh, and so the spiral is really imp important to Pueblo and worldview. It can represent the cyclical nature of time and the way we kind of return to the same themes over and over in our lives. Um, it can also represent migration stories, the way that clans migrated in and out of the Pueblo um, to gain knowledge and to return home to their center place. Um, and so we've laid the exhibit out in a spiral. So as you walk around, the pots uh, kind of spiral you in and then out again. And I think that's really beautiful. A lot of our visitors have talked about the really contemplative way it draws you in. Uh, the spiral also reflects the way the pottery is made. So this is all hand coiled pottery, not thrown on a wheel, but coiled up with clay um, in a kind of quite literal spiral. And so I love that. And then the other main curatorial choice that's really important 
is that we don't have any glass or plexiglass vitrines around the pottery, that the pottery is in the open air. Um, and this is something our consultants spoke to us about, that the pottery is a living being, it can breathe, it needs to be in the same space as us to be able to like, communicate with us and breathe in the same air as us. And so there's no glass or plexiglass vitrines. Wow, what a wonderful opportunity to see these exquisite pieces up close with no glass or anything in between you and the artwork. Fabulous, fabulous. You know, before we look at some more examples, I think it would be interesting to hear a little bit about the geographical, perhaps historical context of where the pottery has originated from. Would you please share, and this is a, a wonderful graphic to uh, emphasize these points. Absolutely, and this graphic is um, on the wall in the exhibition, so if you come to see, you can see this up close. Um, but the Pueblo, Pueblos are called Pueblos because the Spanish, it's the Spanish word for town or village. And so when the Spanish came um, in the 16th century, they called those communities that were settled in permanent structures, Pueblos. Um, but today there are 21 Pueblos that kind of share some cultural um, similarities, but each have their own distinct religions, cultures, languages, uh, but share a bit of culture and worldview. Um, and so of those 21 Pueblos today, 19 are in New Mexico, one is in Arizona and one is in Texas. Uh, but we included all of them on this map. The eight that are represented in the exhibit are in purple, uh, but we included all of them because we want to show that all of these people are culturally connected and they're sharing designs and styles and techniques. Uh, we also included on this map the ancestral homelands of these people at the request of our consultants who felt that it was important not only for us to know where they are now, but where they came from. And so that's why you can see the Grand Canyon and Chaco Canyon marked on these, this map because those are important ancestral homelands for these people. Nice, nice. Well, let's move on and look at some examples. First, what's this uh, wide shot showing us? Uh, so this is my wall. When you first enter the exhibit, these are the pieces that you'll see right away as you pass the map. And these pieces walk us through learning how pottery is made. So this is kind of an intro wall to the exhibit. Um, and if you click through to some of my pieces, yep. So this one talks to us about gathering clay. Uh, at first glance, this piece looks like one of the most simple pieces in the exhibit. We'll see some much more intricate painting later on. Um, but when you start to think about the materials and the time and process that goes into creating this piece, it gets really complex really quickly. Um, clay is often gathered from clay deposits whose location is passed down through families. The paint is all made by hand. Um, blacks, like the, one, the swoops on this, are often made with wild spinach. And so if you think about how you can buy a bag of spinach at the grocery store and it cooks down to practically nothing, and you're like, why did I bother? Um, <laughs> imagine taking huge garbage bags full of wild spinach that you've gathered by hand with your family and then cooking it down into a tiny little pot of paint. Um, and so that's how these pigments are made. And so and the clay has to be gathered by hand and then dried and rehydrated so that it's evenly hydrated and won't crack in the firing. Um, so when you think about all the different materials and time that goes into this, it gets really complex. Mm -hmm. And as we continue uh, more of the process. And so then once you've gotten your clay and you've hydrated it properly, you have to coil it up. Um, so we're talking about making coil snakes. Lots of people have done this with Play-Doh, um, but then coiling it up into the shape of a jar. And I chose this piece to talk about that because of those steep shoulders. Uh, so you can imagine the artist having coiled so carefully and slowly and then get into those shoulders and just really hoping that the piece doesn't collapse in on itself. I mean, it's stunning. Um, just to give a sense of perspective versus the image, about how large is this piece? This piece is maybe yay large and is not far from the largest in the exhibit. Nice, nice. Continuing here, what can we learn? So once the piece is made, it's polished. Um, and often this was done with a smooth stone, like a river pebble, um, but sometimes also done with a cloth. And so this piece is a transitional piece from when potters at San Aldefonso Pueblo started to learn to polish with a cloth from their neighbors at Coach de Pueblo. So here I'm talking about how all these Pueblos are culturally related. They're sharing ideas and techniques. 
Um, so some people at San Ildefonso still polish their pottery with stones, but some polish with cloths. And we can tell from the striations on this piece, if we zoomed in with a microscope, you could see them, and that this piece was polished with a cloth. So this is one of the earliest pieces at San Ildefonso to be polished that way. Nice, nice. And here we have the overview of the piece, and then we're going to be able to take a little closer look. Yeah, so this uh, piece talks about painting. So the pottery is hand painted, um, often with a yucca brush. So a, piece, a yucca leaf is like split the way that little kids kind of split grass blades um, to create a brush. And all of this is hand done, even those tiny little lines. And if you zoom in, you skip to our next picture. You can see these tiny lines that are all hand done with a yucca brush and the control on that is amazing. Mm, mm. And we step back and we see one final piece in this area. Yes, so this piece talks about firing. So none of this pottery is fired in a kiln. It's all fired outdoors um, in fires. The fuel is usually sheep manure that's been dried out and used as fuel for the fire. So you put your piece down, you pile up the manure around it as fuel, you light it on fire, and then you nominate some poor kid to stay up all night and make sure you don't burn the house down. <laughs> Um, and so depending on the manure and the wind, um, you often get these blush marks. You can see kind of these smudges from the fire on the bottom of this piece. Um, and these are not considered flaws in the pottery. These are kind of blessings because they're something that the environment bestowed on the piece, not something you had control over. Mm -hmm. And this is a terrific shot of how things are laid out. A few comments of what went into this type of design? Yeah, this design was really a labor of love from staff across the museum. You know, I came in as the new kid at the museum and was like, let's do a spiral. And all the carpenters here were like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but they got on board. Um, yes, yeah, so to create an ADA compliant spiral that also has emergency exits and is wide enough that you can't reach over and bump one of the pots. Uh, it took a lot of effort, a lot of math and mapping things out on paper and then creating the designs um, with the wood and painting them. Um, so it was definitely a process. The colors here are fabulous, I think. Um, they were inspired by our consultants who told us that reds and purples and gray, yellows and grays were all um, sacred to the various pueblos. And so we chose these, the purple and the yellow to kind of reflect the colors that are important to Pueblos, as well as the landscape of the Southwest. I think you can imagine a beautiful sunset over a mesa, with this deep purple, uh, but also staying away from reds and things that have been used more anthropologically and more history museums, because um, we're very interested in these things as art as well. You know, you've mentioned several times consultants, and I think it's a wonderful example that you and the museum has done, that the whole museum field is moving into recognizing that to uh, put on exhibition these days, need to incorporate the advice and counsel from a wide range of constituents, especially those who have a deep connection to the artwork that's being exhibited. Absolutely. It's something that's really important to us here at Shelburne Museum is valuing all of our audiences, um, including those physically far away, but who are source communities for these items. And it's something we'll be expanding through our other exhibits moving forward, um, even beyond Native American art, we'll be bringing in more and more consultants. Nice, nice. We're going to show a couple of other side shots here. What's uh, to highlight in this image? I love the leftmost pot in the foreground here. This is kind of our sneaky bird pot. In other parts of the exhibit, I have kind of groupings of different bird designs so that you can see the way the same design is used by different artists. Um, but this piece on the left here also has a bird. If you look very closely, you can see kind of a dot in the center that is the eye and then the triangular beak to the left of that and then wings mm -hmm. sprouting above and below. Um, so this is an older design called the rain bird. Um, and part of what I love is just the punniness of putting a rain bird on a water jar um, and the way that all of these pieces are really imbued with kind of hopes and prayers for rain and nourishment in the community. Nice. And then a little close up here. Mm -hmm. 
And I should highlight here this fabulous mount that our staff made. Uh, so on this, this piece right in the foreground, you can just barely see it, but we have custom made mounts for every piece. So even though we don't have glass around them, they're very secure and safe. Um, lots of people have asked about those because they're so well done. People seem to think they're part of the pots, but those are um, handmade by our staff here to keep the pots safe. Nice, nice, and very reassuring for everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let's move on to some nice individual images that you've provided. A few words about this piece. So this piece is a dough bowl. Um, we know from talking to our consultants that even though they're often called dough bowls, they could have held all sorts of things. You just could have held baked bread or stew. Um, but we are in the process of kind of looking at some of the remnants within the bowl to see if there's possibly any mm -hmm. microscopic remains of dough or anything else that can tell us how it was used. Um, nice, nice. And this one? This is one of only two pieces in the exhibit that we know the maker. Um, so you'll notice most of our pieces, we say maker formerly known uh, rather than unknown artist. And this reminds us that these people were known to their communities and their families. And it's only because of a history of collecting and colonization that we've lost those names. Um, and our consultants asked us to say maker rather than artist because these pieces are used in the home, are used as part of everyday life. Um, so it's important to remember that these aren't just fine art hung on a wall, but that these are part of everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, but this piece is attributed to Monica Silva and her great granddaughter, Monica Silva Lovato was one of our consultants. Um, so she got to have a good say in how we displayed her great grandmother's work. And I thought that was really special. Oh, most definitely. And so this is, I was telling you about our groupings of birds. This is one of those pieces. And as you click through the next few slides, you'll see a few more pieces. Uh, these are all Acoma parrots. Um, and so the design name refers to Acoma Pueblo where there is a parrot clan and where parrots are kept often for ceremonial pur purposes. Um, and so I love that you can see how the same design passed down through families and among the community is used differently by different makers depending on their needs, the size of the pot, um, what uh, foliage they can see outside today. Uh, so even though it's the same design, when you start to look closely, it's actually executed very differently. Mm -hmm. And nice. this is a Zia Roadrunner. This is one of the biggest pieces in the exhibit. This is quite a substantial piece, uh, but the Roadrunner on it is so funny. And I think if you forward one more, and you can see just this close up of his silly oh, yeah. little eye, which I love. Um, so again, still doing a bird, but in a slightly different way to represent a different uh, bird and really embed within all these pieces this environmental knowledge that these makers knew what um, mm. plants and animals were around them and were able to articulate that in just a few simple brush strokes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And these are water birds, uh, which is really fun. Water birds on a water jar again. Um, but these are really interesting if you go forward one more slide because they're kind of climbing up the side of the jar on their own little adventure. <laughs> uh, typically in Zuni, this is from Zuni Pueblo, typically in Zuni jars, water birds are more in re distinct registers, almost like a comic book. They each have their own space. Um, and so for them to just go wandering on this jar is shows a really excellent maker who knows her stuff and is able to kind of know the rules to break the rules. Nice to see a sense of playfulness, too, in the work. Absolutely. See, so this one has the more uh, typical style for the water birds, where they're in their own distinct register. Um, it also has a deer in a rain house. Um, and so this deer has a heart line going from its mouth to its heart. And this is kind of the uh, breath or spirit of the animal. It, from, uh, serves as a call for the deer to continue to repopulate so that hunters will continue to be successful and nurture the community. Um, so all of these pieces are just embedded with both this environmental knowledge and also this hope for environmental continuation. And I think in today's climate change, it's really important to think about these things. Very true. What's been some of the reaction and feedback from visitors perhaps people in academia, the museum field? 
Visitors have loved it. Um, we hear a lot about how, because there's no glass and these pieces are so accessible, it feels very different from other pottery exhibits where everything's kind of closed off behind glass. Um, so lots of people are having a very um, meditative, contemplative experience in this exhibit, being able to be so close to the pieces um, and to really be in the same space as them. We've had a lot of people learning about Pueblo art and Pueblo culture for the first time. We've also had a lot of people who have been to places like Santa Fe and Albuquerque and had kind of a vague knowledge of Pueblo cultures, but are now able to kind of put better names on it and understand things more clearly. I'll also point out that um, in each of our labels, we put the indigenous name for the Pueblo first before the Spanish or English name so that our visitors can still make the association if they know the Spanish or English name for the Pueblo. Um, but we're respecting the sovereignty of the indigenous communities and using their language first, which is really important. Um, so even people who do recognize names like Zuni or Akama are now understanding that these people still have their own language and are very kind of vital communities today. What's been some of the related programming and events connected to the exhibition that perhaps have taken place or that visitors can look forward to in the upcoming weeks? So we did an opening reception, uh, gave some remarks of that, and we've done a couple curators tours. Uh, we also did a great yoga event where people could come in and see some of the pottery and contemplate with the pieces for a moment and then go and have some yoga done outside. Um, and that's an ongoing series with different exhibits. So that's a fabulous event um, to come meditate with some art and then do some yoga. And we may have some more programming coming down the pipeline, but we're still nailing things down. How can viewers and others stay informed about the Native American initiative? The best place to go is our website, shelburnmuseum.org. Uh, we also have a Facebook and an Instagram, and we publish events as they happen there. Um, but our website is the best source of material. Okay, you know, in the time remaining, we can enjoy a few more images. So there we see a close up of uh, the previous one. And then if we continue this uh, wonderful design. I love the colors on this, this deep orange. And so as you can see across the exhibit, some of the colors of the slips and the paints and the clay vary slightly between Pueblos. And this all has to do with the natural landscape and the where these things are available. Um, so potters will have places they go to collect these things. They may also have trade networks in which they trade for certain designs, certain colors or certain um, types of clay from other people who have better access to it. And that's something you still see today. I was in Santa Fe last week talking to an artist and asked where a certain color on his pot came from. He said, oh, I traded with it for it from this other guy. <laughs> oh, this is exquisite. And so this is our secret rainbird piece again with a closer up so you can see that beautiful rainbird design and also this geometric design coming off the side of the rainbird, which is absolutely fabulous. Um, a lot of these designs incorporate symbolism for clouds and rain and mountains. Um, these symbols kind of vary from Pueblo to Pueblo and also across time. Um, so you'll see people who make these designs because they know these deep symbolic meanings. And then you'll see people who make these designs because their mothers and grandmothers made these designs. And maybe mm -hmm. they never thought to ask what the specific thing means. Well, Victoria, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. I want to thank you so much for being here, informing us about the exciting Native American initiative, the current exhibition, and continued success with future endeavors. Lots of exciting things happening both now and in the immediate future at the Shelburne Museum. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. I also wanna thank those of you watching for tuning in and hope you'll be able to join us next time.